you'll go to kahoot.it. You have to do that. Or you can scan the QR code, yeah, if you want to, to do that. I tried it. Yeah, the screen picture is not the greatest. started this is just a little seven question activity it's a little bit of competition to see who can answer the fastest and the most correct there's a little award ceremony at the end of it it's been multiple uh, guess yes yeah, multiple choice okay. so title the bible and the gospel here we go question one i'm clocking are you guys i'm clocking i'm just now clocking Oh, there you go. Yeah, it'll it'll change there in a second. Gotcha. All right, so how many times in the Bible is the word gospel used? Okay, I just have squares and just triangles. Pick a color. It matches pick a color. like it matches these answers. See the colors up there. Yeah. Um, so if you think it's five, well, time's up. <laughs> this is twenty seconds. Uh, right. So ninety-eight is the correct answer on that one. Yeah, so you'll have to, I guess, read uh, here the answer choices and then just pick the right color. All right, Evan's in the lead right now, <laughs> 740 points. Here we go. How many times in the Gospel of Matthew is the word gospel used? Zero is red, 15 is orange, 5 is blue, 29 is green. How many times in the Gospel of Matthew? Five is the correct answer on that one. I didn't get it yet. <laughs> Evan's still in the Why is nobody else getting points? I can tell them. <laughs> Evan's dominating. How many times in the Gospel of John is the word gospel used? Red zero, 15 orange, five blue, 29 green. In the book of John. Do what? Going to <laughs> Zero is actually the correct right. answer. I almost did that. Oh no! This is not I don't know why y'all aren't getting any points. <laughs> How many Old Testament books is the word gospel found? In? Zero for red, eleven is orange, five is blue, twenty-three is green. How many Old Testament books is the word gospel found? I don't know. It's probably one. Zero is correct. Oh, now we got some more points coming up here. That's the first one I got right. 
Yeah, you got 713 points for that one. So how come Zach got more than I did? I don't know. Okay. He was faster. Because he was yeah. faster. Oh, yeah. 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 Speed like counts speed into it as too. well. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, how many New Testament books is the word gospel found? Five is red, 19 is orange, 12 is blue, 23 is green. New Testament, how many New Testament books is the word gospel found? <laughs> Nineteen is the wow. correct answer. Yeah, nineteen. How many times did it say? Um, so Ninety-eight <laughs> times so total in yeah, nineteen so books. <laughs> We're pretty bad, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Two more questions. How many New Testament books is the word gospel only found in one time? So the word gospel is in there only once. Um. I have the wrong. Answer. <laughs> See, I have the wrong answer. To no, no, that's right. Zero is red, two is orange, four is blue, seven is green. How many New Testament? Uh, books? I found out. It's four. Four books only have it in there one time in the entire book. That's just kidding. Last question. You Did you miss one? I think he missed. Which book yeah. in the Bible contains the word gospel the most times? Red is Genesis, Revelation is orange, Romans is blue, Hebrews is green. Which book contains it the most times? I'm guessing since we're studying Romans. There you go. I don't believe that. At least I got one. Romans is the correct answer. You have an excuse. You have Here are the winners. Right Third place is Zach, Skeletor Man. Second place is Greg. I'm not sure what that is. It's a brain. It's a brain with the beard. <laughs> and first place, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's just a little fun thing you can do. It's called Kahoot. We do that at school a lot. Kids that's like good. it. Um, but it gets us thinking a little oh, bit. Thank you. And we're going to be in Romans today. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so Book of Romans, we started last week, just did a little introduction. We got down to verse 7, uh, so we didn't get very far on that. But what we determined and identified through the lesson is the writer of the Book of Romans is who? Who wrote the book of Romans? Paul. It was written 57, best we know, 57. Why did you put that one in there? I know, I should have put that one in there. I was trying to focus on the word gospel. Right? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it was written uh, in 57 AD. He was in Corinth. He wrote it, the best we know, during Acts chapter 20. It says that he was in Corinth for three months and we believe that's when he wrote the letter because he keeps mentioning as we go through that he wants to be able to go to Rome he wants to be able to commune with these folks and be with them we know all throughout the book of Acts when we did that study he kept saying I must see Rome I want to go to Rome I've got I'll be in Rome he's even told by Jesus when he's on the ship Fear not, for you will see Caesar. You will see Rome. You, you will get there. And of course, he gets there because he's being tossed around from leader to leader to leader over this crime that he's committed and no one can convict him of. And he's finally like, I appeal to Caesar. So he's like, okay, well, let's send him on to the main guy in Rome. Uh, so that's how he eventually gets there. But, it, but Paul wrote it and he calls himself an apostle. So what's the definition of an apostle? We've talked about this before. The best biblical definition of an apostle that we can come up with. Spreads the, the gospel. Are, are what, what's, what's the difference in an apostle and a disciple? One studied in the cross and the other one. Okay. What was you going to say? Okay. <laughs> I don't remember now. You don't remember? That was like two seconds ago. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. The best that we can kind, of, if we had to categorize it, it is an eyewitness to the resurrected body. Oh, okay. That's what we call a true apostle. 
Uh, that's why there's only 12 apostles. You know, Judas died, so he didn't ever see the resurrected body because he died. Um, Matthias, was that his name? Did he see the resurrected body? I don't know. I should probably know that, but I don't know. But we knew no Paul did because of the road, can't talk, the encounter on the road to Damascus. Now, wait a minute. There's a lot of people that saw the resurrected body. There is a lot of people that saw the resurrected body. So they would technically be considered apostles. I, I think it also ties into being someone who teaches what Jesus taught, a follower of Christ. Because there's a lot of people that saw him resurrected that weren't followers. Right. Right. That's so, what I was saying. Yeah. So I, I would say there's some other criteria, but like, I guess the point of me saying that is you hear a lot of people talk of modern day apostles. It's not really a thing. No one alive today saw Jesus bodily resurrected. You know, unless you have an encounter like Paul, which we don't know how much of Jesus he saw, but we do know he talked with him. He saw a bright light. But he considers himself to be an apostle, namely because he names himself as an apostle right here in the first verse. Uh, but that is a distinction that I've kind of noticed throughout the years studying is an apostle, is a disciple, I guess I should say, but also it was an eyewitness to the resurrected body of Jesus Christ and a disciple kind of tied together. Uh, so there are really no such things as modern day apostles. We get, we get that in some churches. We even have some churches called apostolistic churches where they say that they're apostles, that they can do the miracles of Christ and they can mm -hmm. speak in tongues and heal people and do all these things that the early apostles could do. I have no real reason to believe any of that's legit. It's not to say God couldn't do it, but these people seem to be focused more on themselves and their abilities than anything else. I kind of question all that new modern day apostleship stuff uh, so we would be considered disciples I would say I wouldn't consider myself an apostle because I haven't seen the bodily resurrected Jesus Christ I know he's alive I know he's risen I know he lives in me but I haven't seen him with my eyes so I would consider myself a disciple versus an apostle just to kind of point that out and then he says he's separated unto the gospel of God so there is that word gospel Again, to kind of point this out, the word gospel means what? What's the meaning of the word gospel? The life of Christ. Yeah. The gospel is the stories of Christ. Okay, so literally the word means good news. Oh, okay. It, you it, said that last week. Yeah, literally it means good news. Actually, in, in reality, the word gospel had been used for centuries before Jesus ever showed up. It was used by kings. It said, send the gospel to these people. Send this gospel to these people. He just send this good news to a certain group of people. Well, Jesus is the ultimate good news. So it's kind of been tied in to being focused on Jesus. But the word gospel in general existed prior to Jesus being here on the earth. And it just kind of got overtaken with a new meaning. Of this is... Um, you know the great, the greatest news that the world has ever known. So that's why we use the word gospel, and that's why Paul uses the word gospel here. But to point out, again, the word gospel is not used at all in the Old Testament ever. You don't see it anywhere. You don't see the word Christ in the Old Testament. It's never in the Old Testament. There's only one reference to Christ in the Old Testament, but they use the word Messiah. And the word Messiah is only used one time. It's in the book of Daniel. And that Old, that Old Testament word Messiah, which was originally the Hebrew word, because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, is the same equivalent word to Christ in Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in. So they're the same word, two different languages, but it's only used once in the Old Testament, Christ is, and it's used as Messiah. And in the New Testament, every time we see the word Christ, it means Messiah or the coming one. So we see the word Christ right here in verse 1, servant of Jesus Christ. We don't see the word gospel at all in the Old Testament, but we see it 98 times in the New Testament. And I'm referencing the King James, so I don't know that that will vary from translation to translation. 
uh, but 98 times in all in the New Testament, and all the references are in the New Testament, and here are the books uh, that contain it. Just to kind of point them out quickly. Matthew contains the, the word gospel five times. Mark contains it eight times. How many times do you think it's in Luke? More or less than Mark and Matthew. Mm -hmm. It's actually less. Four times in the book of Luke. In the book of John, we learn from our activity how many times is the word gospel used? Zero. Which is crazy because John is the go-to gospel that we send people to first because it's the, the most impactful one. But it doesn't ever use the word gospel. But, of course, it talks about the gospel or the good news. Acts, the word gospel is used six times. Romans does have the position of it containing uh, the most usage of the word gospel, and that's 13 times. And four of those times are in chapter 1, and four of those times are in chapter 15. And it's twice in chapter 10, and then only once in chapter 2, once in chapter 11, and once in chapter 16. Uh, this is, I found this interesting. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians both have the word gospel used nine times each. So in each book is used nine times. Galatians has it 11 times. Ephesians has it four times. Philippians is eight times. Colossians only twice. 1 Thessalonians is six times. 2 Thessalonians only twice. 1 Timothy only once. 2 Timothy three times. Philemon, once. And I kind of found this interesting. Hebrews only has the word gospel used one time in the whole book of Hebrews, which is an awesome book. First Peter, he mentions it four times. And I found this one surprising. The book of Revelation only has it used once in the entire book of Revelation. Yeah, I figured it would have it. Like, right. Revelation on which one would, would have it the most. Is. Right, but it's actually only one time in the book of Revelation. But it is talked about a lot in the New Testament throughout um, 19 of the books. How many books are in the New Testament? <laughs> you know, 27, 27 books. So the majority of the New Testament. How many books are in the Old Testament? Quizzing the other close, 39. So there's 66 books. So 66 books. 39 and 27 get the 66 books. The original King James Bible had how many books in it? 66. 80. Oh, okay. <laughs> it actually had 80 books because it included the Apocrypha, which is a collection of 14 books that they eventually left out. One of them being the Book of Enoch. We talked about that when we went through the Book of Jude. Anyway, a lot of Bible trivia today. Um, so he introduces himself as Paul immediately, and that uh, he is a servant of Christ, he's an apostle, he's separated under the gospel, and he basically, the first few, not to redo last week's lesson, but he goes through and pretty much says, I'm writing to all those in Rome, and I'm here to declare unto you uh, the Son of God. Uh, verse 4 is a key verse, it says, declare to be the Son of God, talking about Jesus with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So he's immediately preaching. Jesus is the son of God. He's the resurrected Lord. He's, he is the gospel. He is what this letter is going to be all about. Um, and he's saying he's writing to all those who are in Rome. Keep in mind, this was written in 57. So we're looking at what's 57 minus 33. He's a math, you're a math guy. So it's 24 <laughs> years, 24 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 24 years. And there's already been a church established in Rome. Which is interesting because Rome is a highly pagan culture. They, they weren't Christians normally in Rome. But somewhere along the way, within 24 years, a church had been established in Rome already. So that's who he's writing to. And verse 8, he goes on to say, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Everybody says he was a southerner. He says y'all. <laughs> you all. And your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I mean, this is pretty amazing. Rome is like the capital hub of the political world. This is where Caesar 
was at. And, and all the Christians that were persecuted. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, and all the Christians who were persecuted. There is a church established there. And in the little time that they were established, this is kind of awesome and embarrassing at the same time. In 24 years, this remnants, and no one had been to Rome. Paul had not been to Rome to establish a church. John had not been to Rome to establish a church. This thing established itself on its own just by people hearing and going back to Rome and saying, man, y'all got to see what's going on. Let's start talking about this. And a church formed. And in 24 years, it says that their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. How many years has this church been the church? Did we just celebrate? 90 years, right? 90th year. Do you think people in California know what we're doing here? Do we think people in North Carolina know what we're doing here? Alright? Again, awesome news, but embarrassing at the same time. These people in 24 years were known globally. Of course, then it was a little bit smaller situation. America hadn't been established. and all that. I'm sure he was talking primarily about that part of the world, but still. These people were really knocking things out of the park and people were hearing about what they were doing. Their faith was spoken of. It says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel, there's a word again, of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. kind of wonder if that didn't have something to do with their success. Have someone praying for them all the time. That, that's a motivation to me to be praying more, to, to really think about what's going on around our community, around the globe, and I really pray for these people because uh, I think that makes a huge difference. Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So at this point, again, he's in Corinth. We read about it in Acts chapter 20. He's saying, my prayer life includes this, that I can have a, I kind of laugh because we know the story now. We've already been through the book of Acts. His journey to Rome included him being imprisoned and being taken into custody, being passed from leader to leader to leader, being nearly killed several times. Then he got put on a boat that ended up sinking. <laughs> the whole boat was destroyed. He ended up on the island of Malta trying to be helpful by bringing wood to the fire and he got bit by a snake. And they all thought he was going to die. He didn't die. Then they called him a god. And he's like, no, I'm not a god. I'm just a disciple of God. And then he heals uh, the leader's dad in the village there who was very sick with some disease. They load him up and they send him on to Rome where he eventually is sitting there still in, in prison for the rest of his life, basically. Yet his prayer was that I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Well, it certainly was the will of God. And at least the tail end of that, from Malta to Rome, it was a prosperous journey because they gave them everything that they could want as they traveled on the rest of the way. But I'm sure as he was writing this letter while in Corinth, Never had a clue of what he was be going to be going through <laughs> as he was actually going to Rome. Uh, but he had been praying for this day for quite some time. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now, what do we make of that spiritual gift comment? There's several perspectives. Anybody ever studied that out or have any thoughts about what that means? That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. There is a list of spiritual gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through chapter 14. And those are the gifts imparted by God. Mm -hmm. And it's not believed that that's what he was talking about here. Most theologians simply accept that he was just going to give them something to help edify them. Maybe a scroll, maybe a writing, maybe 
just something to be reminded of all that Paul had gone through and all that they have gone to. It doesn't really mean a active spiritual gift or an ability. It just means some type of a symbol that this is a good reminder. This is hopefully going to be an encouragement to you. It says, to the end that you may be established. You know, has anyone ever given you something meaningful, memorable that you have probably hanging on your wall right now? Well, okay, I'm thinking. Okay, when you became a deacon, maybe a certificate, mm-hmm. something like that. Um, you know, I have my te- my preaching license and my ordination certificate and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think at home, I brought it in here, the little P52, the transcript of John. I have that hanging on the wall in, the, in our living room. It's just a little... I think that's kind of what he's talking about. It's just something that they could look at and say, okay, this is, this is nice to have. It's remembrance of what we're doing here, where we're going. And that's really all he's referring to there. Any questions, any other thoughts? He's just kind of introducing himself and, and kind of letting people know where his mind is. So verse 13, he gets into the teaching kind of aspect of this. He is wanting them to know certain things. So let, let's think about what's the purpose of these letters as they were originally written. Why do you think he even wrote this? Why do you think he even wrote this letter to the Romans? Like, what was the purpose of the letter to Timothy, the letter to the Romans, the letters to the Church of Corinth, the letters to Galatians? Why did they even write these? <laughs> well, I, I, I would be a pure guess, but I would assume it's so. Someone of the apostles was given guidance or. Or direction right is, is is one of two things that I that I see clearly as we go through is either um, just encouragement or simple instruction or even correction yeah, <laughs> and reproof they do that because there's a lot of the letters are like I can't believe you're already straying away from what right. I've taught you know some of the letters that he writes um, you know the, the Bible oh shoot where is it I'm trying to think it tells us that um, I have to look at that. I should. Let me see if I can remember. Where's the verse that says all Scripture is inspired by God? Does anybody know? Google. Google. <laughs> One day when AI takes over Google, I don't want to be dependent on that. There it is. Second uh, Timothy three sixteen. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses. I actually wrote my doctoral paper on this one verse. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, and that mentions four things. So these could be the reasons of why these letters are written. First of all, for doctrine. We've got to understand what the basic fundamental teachings are and what they're supposed to be about. For reproof. For correction. And then for instruction in righteousness. So Zachary is about to go get his learner's permit at some point. And I have taught Joy how to drive a car. I remember going through the process of learning how to drive a car. And for some reason, I always have those images and memories come to mind when I read this verse. Because we want to decipher what's the difference in doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction and righteousness. Like if we had to explain what those four things mean, I kind of think of it for some reason through drive, learning how to drive. Okay, so what do we do before we actually get in the car behind the wheel? We have to study and take some kind of test. That's the doctrine part of it. There's some basic things you need to know before you really get started, and that's that's what the Bible's good for to tell us this is what you need to know before you even really start moving forward. For reproof. So when when we're driving down the road, right? You might remember this in your experiences, I don't know. You're driving down the road and you're driving, you're just learning how to drive, and the person in the passenger seat is saying, Now watch out for that sign. Watch that stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. You know, be easy going around this turn. They're kind of preemptively correcting you or noticing where you may be going off a little bit and they're telling you 
stay on track, stay on track. That's in my mind is kind of what reproof is. You're reiterating what's been taught in a way that hopefully will be a preemptive correcting measure. But, and I, I witnessed this firsthand, I was at Tennessee High School, I was in the back seat of the driver's aid car and there's this girl who every time the teacher talked to her would look at him while she was driving <laughs> and not be paying any attention at all. And there were many times he had to grab the wheel and keep us on the road or step on his brake on his side. In my mind, that's actual correction. Sometimes God has to correct us. He tells us what we need to be doing. He warns us along the way with unctions through the Holy Spirit of, yeah, you really need to not do this, don't go this direction, make sure you stay on course, but then sometimes He's got to get a hold of us and He's got to correct us. And the Bible's good for that too. It tells us a lot about where we've messed up. Romans is a perfect example. All of sin, think we to the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But, the last part for instruction and in righteousness, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Once we kind of know the basics, we make our mistakes, we receive correction, he's like, okay, now, now that you've learned this, let's apply this moving forward, and here's your instruction in righteousness of how you stay on the right path. This is where my brain kind of goes through those four phases. But that's kind of, I think, the reason all these books are written. Paul was writing for many of those reasons. You know, of course, he's the one that pinned down that verse I just read as he's writing to Timothy. Uh, so he immediately, pretty early in the letter, goes into, now I would not have you ignorant. So what he's saying, ignorant brethren. He, why do you think he makes that statement? Because he makes that statement quite often <laughs> throughout multiple letters that he's written. I would not have ignorance you... Ignorance is just not knowing. Right. right. Ignorance is not knowing either of something or you you don't realize that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And I need to help you to understand what you need to be doing here. That's part of that reproof and that instruction, the doctrine part. So he says, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Speculation, I guess, but why do you think he made that statement? He's saying, I would not have you to be ignorant that oftentimes I purpose to come to you. I kind of wonder why he made that statement. What, what would you all... What's the word? Deduce or infer from that? Like if you said that to somebody he's today, why he hasn't been there before now? Right, and maybe he's heard word that people are saying, "Why hasn't Paul been right. here?" Right. And we don't know that, but I kind of wonder if he's either preemptively trying to address it because he keeps saying, "I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Rome." Maybe he's heard that. Well, you know, Paul, he's going everywhere else. But he hadn't been here yet. Maybe he's trying to comfort them in a way. Not really sure, but he's reassuring them that he wants to be in their presence. Which tells us he hasn't been there yet. Um, for the purpose, he says, that I might have some fruit among you also, even among other Gentiles. So what does he think that means? What, is, what does it mean to have fruit among you also? Like, he was maybe waiting on them to show a little bit more, like, fruitful. Well, he said that their faith has been spoken of throughout yeah. the world. So, I mean, he was maybe waiting on them to go to Rome, waiting on them to have, like, show their fruits of the Spirit. Maybe. What do y'all think? <laughs> some leadership skills that somebody yeah. had, some, somebody else was maybe. able to... Because Paul's the guy. Meaning they have potential. Right. Paul's yeah. the guy right now right. who seems to be, you know, spearheading most of the church. Maybe that's it. That he's wanting to just be a part of it, to share what he's learned. 
kind of thing. And maybe it's there's some great things already happening, and he just wants to go be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't really know the, the full breadth of, of that statement, but there's a desire within him to want to go be a part, either because they're already doing something great, or he sees the potential in them to do something great, and he wants to go nudge it ahead. You know, I, I wish I had that more in my life, where I could say, I'm praying for people in our community. I see little groups that are trying to do this, or even ministries within our own church, to do more, to get out there, to see what else we can do, to see how big we can bring this thing. And, but we we become very complacent over the decades in our churches, and we just kind of go to church and I have a good service today, hey, uh, and we just go home and go about the rest of our lives and build robots the rest of the week, right? We just get just consumed with our jobs and all that. We just want to be fed. We just want to be fed. We don't want to be the feeders. And fruit is a key thing there. You know, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, I did a sermon one time on this, and it, it probably resonated more with me than anybody. Um, but I asked the congregation, what's the purpose of the fruit? Because it says that you know you'll have fruit. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of fruit? If you're a tree and you've got all this fruit, does the fruit benefit the tree? Doesn't benefit the tree at all, and in some cases can actually hinder the tree by having too much fruit, and that's why it has to be pruned. The fruit is for other people. So if we have all these fruits or fruit of the spirit, love, patience, gentleness, kindness, all these things, that's to be addressed towards other people. And I, you know, I always try to ask myself, am I letting people feed off of me in a positive way, or are they just offended by everything I say and do? You know, of course, you know, it depends on your audience, I guess, at that point. Uh, but that's something to reflect on, is, is he wants this fruit, not for himself, but so that the people could benefit greater through what God has done in his life and what God can also do in theirs. And he really addresses this in a way that really kind of impacts me here lately and I want to do better at this. As a class, I'd like for us to think about ways of doing this better. It says in verse 14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So what is that word debtor? In general terms, who, what is a debtor? You owe, somebody. you owe somebody something. Okay, if you've taken out a loan, you owe that back. Right, that's what a debtor is. You owe it. So, does is, is he taking out loans from people and he's got to pay them back? You know, does he really owe these people things? He says, "I'm a better a debtor." both to Greeks and to the barbarian. The, the term barbarian is just used for anyone who's not a Greek. That was kind of a Grecian term, that you're either a Greek or you're a barbarian kind of thing. It's a very probably racially driven thing. Um, but he's just addressing that because the Romans were very rich in the culture, the Grecian culture. So he say, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. So what does he owe these people? There's two ways of looking at being a debtor. One is you've taken out a loan, for instance, or you've you've taken something personally that you need to repay. And there's another essence of this term of someone has given you something to give to someone else. Pay it forward. Pay it forward kind of thing. Or it could just be something like, um, you know, for example, I, when I worked at, I don't know why I remember this, I worked at AutoZone in college, I guess it was, and there was a guy that rented a building on my grandmother's property to fix up cars and all this stuff, and he was in there buying parts, and he gave me $100. He said, here, give this to your grandmother for our rent. So I was obligated, sure. even though I didn't know my grandmother $100, I was obligated to take what was given to me and to give it to her. And once I did that, I was relieved of that debt situation. And that's what Paul is saying is he's been given something from God. It's called the gospel. And he feels to the point he is indebted 
to give this to everybody that will possibly listen. That's the true context of this word debtor, is we have something awesome. We have Jesus. We have God living inside of us. And because of that, we should feel the need to share that with everybody that can possibly come across our path and receive that also. I mean, why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the heart that, that I want to work more on myself. And I think us as a class can think about ways of how can we become this kind of mindset to where we see and feel, wow, we've got something so good, I've just got to share this with somebody. It says here, it says, Paul had an obligation. It's sort of the way you said it. I like that. Obligation to God to fulfill the divine mandate to minister to Gentiles and Greeks. There you go. He, he wanted to share this with everybody that he could possibly share it with. And I wonder how often, you know, do we really do that ourselves? You know, I, I, I bait people on Twitter <laughs> just to get a conversation going. I'm trying to back off of that because it gets a little crazy. Uh, but I do feel like I want people to think about this stuff. I really want people to think about why do they not believe in God? Why have they chosen to believe in some crazy idea that nothing created everything and that we evolved from some blob in the water? And you know, There's so many questions that I just come up in my mind about how that doesn't even make sense. Yeah. You know, we're talking, me and Lori were talking about last night, driving down the road, I was just looking at all the trees and stuff, and I'm like, I was like, because she's a science teacher, so I was like, let me get this straight. I was like, so all these trees and this grass around here, they feed off of carbon dioxide, right? She's like, yeah. I was like, and we feed off of oxygen. She's like, yeah. I was like, well, that puts a big kink in in the works for some people who say that the seven days of, or six days of creation, each day was millions of years. Like, if that's the case, he created plant life on one day, and it wouldn't have survived for millions of years without having animals and humans living, expelling carbon dioxide so the plants can feed off of us, so that we can feed off the plants. That within itself shows design, that it's set up that way. There's no one in evolutionary space that can explain that, or even address that. Like, we, we come from an explosion in outer space where there is no oxygen. <coughs> yet we depend, we're, we're dependent on oxygen to live. I struggle <laughs> with, with that whole concept, how somebody could believe all of that. It's, yeah. It's harder to believe than it absolutely creation. Is. I just, I'm, and I, I And I'm like, okay, well, we started in the water, yet... We evolve, so the, the concept and idea of evolving is you want to get better and adapt to a different environment. Well, if you're living in the water and you're fine living in the water, why would you even adapt to living on land when you didn't know you need to live on land, right? But then some of the, the evolutionists I've been reading about say that hippopotamuses are an evolutionary marvel and is a transitional species of an elephant turning into a whale. And then it's going the other way. Then why is there still hippopotamuses? Exactly. Why are there still elephants? <laughs> yeah. Why are there hippopotamuses? Why are there whales? I mean, it just doesn't even make yeah, sense. I, I, and I feel like I've got an answer called the gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like I just need people to think of it, at least think about it and share this with them. So that's kind of the attitude of this I'm a debtor. Is that we've got something so amazing that we really just need to find ways to share it in a way that's productive. Uh, and oftentimes Twitter's not the most productive environment <laughs> to try to do that. But you learn a lot. I learn a lot anyway through those engagements. Um, anyway, verse 15, we'll close out there as we're about out of time. But it says, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I kind of want us this week, individually, to think about where is our Rome? Who in our community are our Roman citizens that we need to share this with? Is there a neighborhood that we need to go to? I've even thought to the point of just writing up a letter saying, hey, my name is, you know, don't even give your last name or whatever, but my name is John, and we're studying the book of Romans over at Oak Grove Baptist Church and just want to invite you to come. And just literally mail it to some random person, maybe to a hundred random people. 
just find addresses, just drive around and look at people's addresses, write them on an envelope, send it to them. Who knows? Maybe they'll show up. Maybe it'll get them thinking. Maybe they'll open up the Bible and start reading it. I don't know. Or we could do something more deliberate, like identify some people that we want to hear them hear more about the gospel. And we just point blank invite them to come. I don't know. I have reconfigured the room to accommodate more folks with that in mind. Uh, you know, we've we've got seats for twelve. We can we can line them up on the wall if we have to and find seats for more. But we have been growing in the class a little bit. But I, I want us to really think about how how can we reach our Rome here around us and how can we have this kind of a debtor attitude of I've just got to share this with somebody and let's go out there and invite people to come in to hear about the study of the gospel. So that's just a challenge this week that we can do and take on and see who, who can I really think of and how can I get this message out there to get people to come to class, to come to our church. If nothing else, just to come to God and to get into the Word of God um, and see how, how we can help Paul's efforts to build up the kingdom of heaven. That's the ultimate reason we're here. So I think it would be something cool for us to think about this week of how we can maybe do a better job at reaching people. Y'all got any thoughts, questions, anything before we close? All right, we're getting ready to get into some really awesome verses and then the wrath of God. That gets pretty crazy starting in verse 18, so we'll pick up there next week. So we'll see you all online then, and we'll see you guys hopefully back next week as well.